Hello everyone, I'm Ben Coleman, one of your hosts here at the Florida Aviation Network, coming to you broadcasting live and in the clear from the Sebring Terminal here at the Regional Airport. And we're at the 2019 U.S. Sport Aviation Expo. It's an annual event, and if you have not been to the Sport Aviation Expo, you, you really, if you have any interest in aviation, it all basically starts right here. And it, it, it really does start, and that one of our guests that we... Uh, we always have some dynamic folks to speak with that we extract as much information out of them as we can in a 15-20 minute period, but we always give you a, a glimpse of what's available out there, where to go to find more information. So without uh, further ado, as they say in the business, uh, I'd like to introduce you to uh, John Roush. John. Thank you, Ben. It's good to be here. And it's so good to have you, John. Tell me, because we were, we were worried there. We were running a little <laughs> bit behind, but that's okay. We recovered. Well, I'm about a half day behind in some of the stuff, but we're going to catch up. Well, um, I'm, I'm trying to get my first win here this morning. Yeah. But, uh, John, tell us a little bit about, I think you're involved with the EAA activity and yes, some sir. youth training, youth well, education. Well, um, we've had a long history with the Expo. EAA Chapter 1240 has been a part of this from the very beginning, and it has <coughs> grown considerably over the years. Um, our chapter, like the over 900 chapters in EAA land, is... Uh, we're focused primarily on youth aviation education, and as a result of that, uh, a few years ago, about eight years ago, we formed a partnership, an official partnership between the Sebring Airport, the local workforce board, the um, EAA chapter, and the school board. I started an av aviation program at Lake Placid High School 20 years ago, and, and this program has grown exponentially. and. Um, Presently, uh, we're working with the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association high school curriculum, and we're one of uh, 80 schools that were selected out of 37,000 to offer the AOPA curriculum, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, the other thing that's pretty exciting, you know, I've been teaching at Lake Placid High School uh, with the program and doing an online uh, element of it uh, through the other two high schools. In Florida, we, we, our school districts are by county, mm -hmm. we have three high schools in the county. Anyway, the other two high schools, Seab Sebring and Avon Park, we've been doing it online. Next year, we're bringing the whole program um, to the airport at our aviation development facility. So the high school students will be taking um, a morning program in aviation and aerospace here. They'll return to their home school in the afternoon and take their core academics and be able to participate in sports and, and those types of things. So um, we're, we're trying to give kids um, options and opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. Unless they ex are exposed to some of the uh, amazing things that are available, um, they don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the 20 years, um, we've had some, uh, you know, the kids just keep surprising us. I, uh, one young man, left us, went to uh, Florida State, um, or University of Florida, but I don't want to get that mixed up, <laughs> and uh, got his engineering degree, worked for SpaceX, helped develop the Dragon resupply vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Kyle came back with his family and young child and was visiting at the Aviation Center, and I said, well, Kyle, what are you doing now? Because I knew he left SpaceX to go to, to Scandia and uh, in California, and he said, well, Mr. Roush, I could tell you, but I have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I, w I will tell you it involves nuclear power and satellites. And, you know, so we have young people like that doing things. Another young lady is a, s a Czech engineer for NASA. Uh, NASA. We have uh, a young man who's flying less seat for American Airlines. It just goes on and on and on. Um, but the main thing is we want to be able to give our young people in this county as much of a perspective of what's out there in the STEM curriculum, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, and math, as we can. Um, and we've, we've started to grow what we call a community aviation education program mm -hmm. that involves a lot of components like the school board, the workforce board, the airport, the YAS program here at the airport, um, where kids will come out and they'll get exposed to a lot of the things that are here, but what do you do next? Mm -hmm. And so, our program is continuing that uh, that involvement year round. John, we're uh, we're terribly guilty in the aviation world of using acronyms, but tell us what YAS program is all about. Uh, Young a Aviator Zone. Okay. Uh, they've been playing with. It. My wife has also been involved in it, and you know it varies from Young a Aviator Zone to Youth 
aviator zone. I think it's young av aviator zone. But Yaz has a nice little ring to oh, it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's got absolutely. a Yazzie uh, approach to yeah. it. But you betcha. John, where, uh, and this is primarily for county uh, folks that you are involved with the... Actually, the uh, Ben, we're, we're reaching out beyond that because when you look at the what we call an educational consortium here in Highlands County, it reaches out to the neighboring counties like, like Glades and Hendry and those types of things. So there will be youth coming into the uh, expo over the next couple of days from all those counties. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, uh, excuse the pun, but the sky's the limit. You know. Well, and, and it's really up to us. I mean, we're, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not new to the game. Let's no. just put it to you. We, we have some season, and I'm proud to see that you have some girth. <laughs> you, you've been you've been bodybuilding like I have. Well, you know, I found that uh, some of the airplanes that I've flown over the years have have started to shrink, mm -hmm. and it's amazing how aluminum can do that. But they do. So. Well, and I uh, people don't know this, but I'm on a hair loss program, <laughs> and it's coming along quite well. I think. Yeah, me too. Well, I tell my students I'm more aerodynamic. <laughs> True. But you know, we've got to keep it entertaining and light and interesting for the young people. And I will never forget, it's one of the trade shows we were talking about. Uh, we got an aircraft display, and you can see a whole gaggle of kids come up. Sure. And, you know, the guy I'm working with, oh, God, all these kids, are, they're going to leave fingerprints and bubble gum, and oh. just, they're going to just really mess the airplane up. I said, wait a minute. That's what we're here for. Let's tell them what not to touch. Let's yeah. show them how to wiggle the stick and what, what it does out on the wing. And uh, so it, it's really up to us, the old-timers, well, I, I have a couple a couple unique things that have happened over the years. When we first started the program at Lake Placid, um, we built an aircraft in the shop, and then we found that we couldn't get all the kids in the class working on the airplane at once. It's just logistically difficult. So we switched to working with a local RC radio control group, and the kids were flying in those airplanes and working on a buddy box and then soloing and making a big, big to-do about the solo. Well... The unit I was covering on your licensing, I took out my pilot's license and I was showing the kids. And one of the older gentlemen in the flying club, uh, RC club, said, well, let me show you mine. And he pulled it out and it was signed by Orville Wright. <laughs> you know, that, that had an impact, you know. And I think another thing that we enjoy a lot here is flying young eagles where uh, the Experimental Aircraft Association provides rides for kids between 8 and 17 mm -hmm. give them an experience they get a logbook a certificate they can participate online with a ground school uh, through Sporty's Pilot Shop in Embry Riddle so uh, there's this young man from Avon Park uh, a few years ago he was so excited he was just a motor mouth all about planes and he knew every plane and everything and that sort of thing I get him in the airplane we strap up we start up I take off and I get up to the altitude about 2,500, and it's dead silent in the cockpit. Mm. And I'm thinking, oh, my, you know, this is not good. Is he going to upchuck over the panel? Is he scared? What's going to happen? And I asked him on the intercom. I said, uh, are you okay? What's going on? And he just turned to me and gave me the biggest smile. He said, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> you know, and, and that type of impact, um, yeah. where else would this young man have had that opportunity? Um, and, and another young young lady, um, t I took her up, and, and, and when I get the kids up, I like to have them take the controls. And I asked her, would you like to fly the airplane? Oh, no, no, I don't want to do that. So I didn't push her. I just left it. Mm -hmm. Well, she had such a good time. I said to her, would you like to do this again? And she said, sure. So we arranged to do it the next uh, Sunday. I'm in the airplane getting ready to start up, and she gives me a shot in the ribs. And she says, don't do anything yet. And I'm thinking, no more. And she's scared. She says, I want you to explain everything on the panel, what all the gauges and all they do. Mm -hmm. So I went from left to right, explained everything, the altimeter, gas gauges, oil pressure, everything. So we're on a takeoff roll, and she's monitoring the, the takeoff speed and the rate of climb and all this sort of stuff. She was into it. So we get up to altitude, and I said, well, you, you ready to take the airplane? She says, yeah. I said, but before you do that, um, I understand you have a horse. Yeah. I said, well, you want that horse to turn left or right. You don't yank on the reins. You just lay the reins over the neck of the horse and let the horse know what you want it to do, right? Yeah, very gentle. I said, same thing with an airplane. I said, I fly with two fingers. I just let the airplane know what I want it to do, and it'll do it. And she, we were doing turns on a point and all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people, when they get in an airplane for the first time, they grab that yoke, and they think the harder they grab on, the safer they are. And then they start 
jerking it around, and you know as well as I do, you start chasing the airplane. Um, she was dead on. We were we were doing uh, 360s and not losing 50, 100 feet altitude. Wow. It was it was incredible, you know. And so, we find a lot of young people today uh, when they come into an aircraft like that. There's a lot of transferable skills from the computer programs they've worked with, mm -hmm. um, and they're great learners. They really are. Well, how about a subject that's near and dear to my heart is maintenance. I'm a mechanic by trade. Sure. And uh, people say, well, I thought you were a pilot. So, well, I am. I, I'm a mechanic, <laughs> but I just fly because it's easy. They won't fly unless they're fixed. Oh, no. But uh, but it's it's hard to admit, and uh, particularly in a group of pilots, how easy it is to fly. But also how easy it is to let things get away from you yes. to where it's not fun anymore. No. This could this could hurt me. <laughs> so. Well, we, we have an interesting thing going on right now with our, our education program I'm involved in and our chapter emphasis. Uh, our, our kids are building an air cam. Now, they're not just standing by and having an adult let them pull a rivet. They're doing everything from A to Z. And that's that happened with Story Musgrave, the astronaut. Mm -hmm. He was one of our speakers uh, a couple years ago said to me, you know, I'd like to get an air cam. I said, if you go over to that table there, talk to, uh, this was during our dinner, talk to Phil Lockwood, he could probably get you going. Well, that Sunday after the dinner, I emailed Story and said, thank you for being a speaker. And I said, by the way, you had mentioned an air cam. I said, if you decide to get one, how about if we turn it into a youth project? And I said, now think about it. We're talking about a 200000 dollar airplane. It took him less than five minutes to email me back, said, we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And we've been building it uh, ever since. And uh, to see these kids uh, go through the manual step by step, learn how to drill, pull rivets, do everything they have to do, buck rivets, um, it's pretty amazing. You know, and um, they're going to be listed as an official builder of the airplane in the registry. Um, so that, you know, being a shop teacher for the last 48 years, uh, I appreciate the skill set that these kids are gaining mm -hmm. because it's transferable to almost any industry, any, mm -hmm. any discipline. And, John, it, it's, it's not easy. I mean, because as we age, uh, sometimes... We don't want, bend as much as we used no, to. No, <laughs> we're not nearly as flexible either. Uh, but anyway, but it does take a lot of patience. It takes actually skill. And some people just are not good working with kids. Well, I, I, I have loved to work... All my whole career has been with high school kids and young adults and and the success i've had and i've written very 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 few probably less in the 20 years of the late class are probably less than five or eight referrals mm -hmm. um the the point is if you give young people responsibility they'll live up to it mm -hmm. and it, and i found recently in the last 10 15 years using a stern heavy voice with kids is not what they need because they they have too much of that at home um, and, and I've had young, young men and women have a problem in the shop or whatever we're doing, and I'll take them off to the side and say, you know, this isn't you. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on? You know, and you start a dialogue, and they open up to you, and you realize that there's so much happening outside the classroom, they're just venting in your classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I'll say, I right, just sit over there and, or go into the other classroom, ch chill out, and when you're ready, come on back, and we'll get started. I, I never confront them in front of other people. Um, you know, you be a, a, an adult that's willing to listen. It works every time. And uh, uh, the, the thing I love to see with our, our program here, we have kids coming in at various times. They'll see what we're doing. They'll want to get involved. So the kids that have been there for a while, just take them in and absorb them. They're showing them how to, mm -hmm. to put a drill in a chuck and how to drill and, and how to follow the directions. It's kids teaching kids. It's wonderful. It really is. Well, what's the next step? Where are we going from here? I mean, because you've got your hands full for probably at least the next, I don't know, 20, 25 years. <laughs> so, I hope so. Uh, where, do we, uh, where do we go from this point? I Have think, you know, being the type of educator I've been, we need to have more project-based learning. Um, if you're going to talk about concepts of physics or, you know, any type of science concept, you need to be able to apply it and work with it, and that's what we're doing with the airplanes. Um, you know, we do so much testing in schools, and unfortunately, we wind up teaching to the test, which really isn't a measurement of what they've learned. Um, what, you, what I feel we need to do is provide more hands-on learning, more project-based learning, aligned with the, the curriculum that we need to teach and the standards. Um, the challenge with that that schools have faced, it takes time, it takes money. Mm -hmm. 
And until we make that commitment that we're willing to take the extra time and spend the extra resources to make that happen, we're just going to continue to chase our tails. That's Roush's opinion about education, but uh, I know how I've done it for the last almost 50 years, and that works, absolutely works. So where are we going, Ben? We need to have schools do more and more of the things that we're doing here with our school district. Um, I was a, a resource for the AOPA National Symposium last November talking about how to build a, a community aviation education program. Um, and there's a lot of enthusiasm out there to do that. Um, and really, quite frankly, from a teacher's point of view, when you have kids come into your classroom and they're excited about learning and they want to learn this stuff and they see the reason for it and where it can lead them, it makes the teacher's job a whole lot more easier and a lot more fun. Yeah. That's where we need to go. Well, it energizes you. When you Absolutely. see the kids pumped up, you get pumped up. Even if you don't feel maybe on your A game that day, <laughs> it doesn't take you long to get on the A game. And, and uh, judgment, yeah. judgment skills. I, I heard for years and years that you can't teach judgment. You either have good judgment or you don't. Well, I disagree because yeah, I, I do too. scenario-based training is, is excellent to give them, if this happens, what do you think the outcome is going to be? Or if you do this, what's the outcome going to be? Right. So just talk it through with them. And uh, well, they're so used to in 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 a lot of the fast-paced curriculum we have to deal with today in schools. Um, there's not the time to let them process that. There's not the time to let them make a mistake and learn from it, where they're not going to be seriously hurt or anything like that. But um, it's okay to stretch yourself. A lot of young people are afraid to make that step forward to put themselves outside the box. Mm -hmm. Um, we as educators need to provide that safe place where they can do that, uh, where they can stretch themselves. Um, I'll tell you a, a funny, uh, it's a sweet thing, and I've done this every year in my av aviation class. There's a book that we as aviators know that's pretty pretty cool, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Mm -hmm. I took that book and I read it to the class, and I had a lot of fun. I had the voice inflections of Fletcher Gull and and Jonathan and all the things and the kids you know I'm reading to high school kids and say all oh, kids don't want to do it. they were hanging on every word and um, then I had them write a reflection about what that story meant to them individually mm -hmm. and the responses I got brought me to tears unbelievable um, kids are looking for that opportunity to stretch to be themselves to learn new things and they need an adult guide to help them get there, not to manage them, but to help them, you know, you may want to try this approach, or you may want to go over here, take a look mm -hmm. at that, tell me what you think. Um, it's pretty exciting. Well, and John, to be uh, accomplished, and you're obviously an accomplished educator. Well, I, I get uh, by. It's, uh, I, I use a, a, a number of little phrases, but it's, uh, sometimes it's cool to be corny. <laughs> I mean, being corny with kids. Yes, it is. Kind of lets them know that, wow, this old guy's, uh, He's approachable. Well, you know, I, I, I've done those things all my life, and I get crazy in there, and they remember it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've had kids call me back. Um, one gentleman, he's 30 now. He was in my aerospace and drafting class, and he called me up, and they said, do you know who this is? And I played along because I could see it on my cell phone. I said, talk a little bit more. Maybe I'll get it. You know, and then he talked. They said, Chuck, how you doing? He said, how would you know that? Anyway, we talked. He's now a captain in a fire department said to me, you know, I wanted to thank you for what you taught me in drafting class. We had a recent fire where I had to sketch out quickly a floor plan, and they asked me later, how'd you learn that? And I said, he said, in Mr. Roush's drafting class. Mm -hmm. Then he had an aircraft incident that uh, they had to deal with, mm -hmm. and he knew how to handle it from the aerospace class. So he said, I would not be where I am today and rose up through the ranks unless I had your courses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I I get a lot of those calls over the years, and those are the pay those are the paychecks that really mean the most to us. Yeah. Um, and we're going to keep doing it as long as I can keep breathing and keep walking and talking. I'm going to do it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, Captain Roush. <laughs> what uh, what have you accomplished in your other than educating? You've been flying for a while. You've been around airplanes. Sure. What's the, your most memorable fun event that you can recall having an aircraft? Uh, not the most scary, but the, the fun, enjoyable. Either building one, flying one, first solo two, one. Two things stick in my mind. One is that, that one I mentioned before when the young man turned to me and said it was the best day of his life. Mm -hmm. The other one maybe wasn't fun, but it was dynamic, and, and the outcomes were significant. 
Um, when I worked for the National Park Service at Mount Rainier, I was running youth programs, and we were doing stuff in the backcountry and other things. Well, I arranged for a, a reserve unit of Chinook helicopters to support us during the summer. So we had an LZ set up with three or four Chinooks in the park. LZ, I'm sorry. Landing zone. Oh, okay. That's what I thought you said. With fuel and all those types of things. You and your acronyms. Go ahead. So I got a knock on my, I lived in the park, and I got a knock on the door about 5.30 in the morning, and it's a rescue ranger from the Paradise Visitor Center. Paradise is at 6,000 feet, and that's where people uh, prepare to, to, tr to go to climb the mountain. He said, we have a climbing party at 13.5 that are stranded, and rescue helicopters can't go up there. They're too high. Do you think your Chinook guys will want to go up and get them? Well, let's go find out. So we went down to the, to the LA or LZ, and the guys were up, and course these are all Vietnam vets and they said yeah let's go well we couldn't see 10 feet in front of us because the ground fog you look up and see blue you're not supposed to fly didn't matter to these guys so we're off I'm in the jump seat between both pilots a topo map on my lap kind of thinking where they might be and suddenly we get closer to the mountain rising up and then the rock started sh showing through the snow and then some of the rocks started waving yeah. we found them <laughs> but here's the problem the slope was like this mm. So the, the helicopter came in, backed in, put the rear wheels down on the snow, held a hover at 13.5. The back rotor was just missing the other snow by five or six feet. We went out, grabbed everybody in. Then he just dropped the nose, and we kind of went down the slope, and we're off to uh, Puyallup, which is between Seattle and Tacoma. Now, we call, they called ahead, told them we were coming, but a Chinook is not going to land on a hospital helipad. We got there early enough, we landed in the parking lot, they brought a gurney out, and as we were landing, I'm watching out the window and all the fences of the houses around the parking lot are going wop, 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 we just flattened everything. So I'm thinking, well, I better go in and tell people about this. So I go in, I got my flight suit and my SP4 helmet, I found an administrator and I said, you know, we're going to, we ruined some of your neighbor's fences, and he said, I don't worry about it, we'll be cool. Well, we take off. <clears throat> Later that afternoon, we're on another sortie dropping supplies off, and we get another call to do a rescue. Somebody had fallen in a ravine, broken their leg, loaded them up back to Puyallup. Well, we can't land in a parking lot. It's full. So we land in the fairgrounds across the street from the parking lot. I ride up in the ambulance from the fairgrounds, and uh, I meet the same administrator. Mm. He said, we had a staff meeting in the morning. We've designed, uh, decided to develop a landing zone for you guys at the fairgrounds. Well, as a result of that series of things in, in 1982, I think it was, Fort Lewis, which is an Army base that trains uh, regular Army helicopter pilots for Chinooks, mm -hmm. as a result of what we did with the reserve unit at Rainier, they are now are tasked at Fort Lewis to support rescues at Mount Rainier. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was all because of what we did with the youth program there. So, you know, when I look back on that, uh, there's been a lot of people since then that, that have been uh, supported by the Fort Lewis Army, uh, and I'm pretty proud of that. You know. So those, those are two things that stick in my mind. Well, those are accomplishments, and I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't notice uh, 5-1 Hotel on your jacket. Uh, yeah, this is, this is the aluminum overcast B-17 that EAA has restored. It flies around the country. Uh, uh, supporting our, our veterans and, and the chapters. Uh, we had it come here two years ago as a host, and the most amazing thing, you know, this base, Hendricks Field, and during World War II, had 200 B-17s mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And so when we had the Lumen Overcast here, the amount of people that came out that had some connection mm -hmm. with, the, with the aircraft uh, w was just amazing. Uh, the people that flew it, flight engineers, flight instructors, people that met their wives, started their families here because of the of the base. Mm -hmm. um, truly amazing. And so uh, when I wear this, uh, and I had a chance to fly it basically from Sarasota to here, so mm -hmm. I got about a half hour PIC in the left seat. Then when I was sitting in that in that airplane flying it, and I had to maneuver it around Avon Park because the Golden Knights were up there practicing, and we had arranged to do a flyby of the tower at the range mm -hmm. as a photo op. As I was maneuvering the airplane around, I, I realized that 70 some years ago, there were kids, a third of my age, mm -hmm. flying these things every mm -hmm. day and never coming home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so when you, when you see that type, you know, I'm looking out those engines and realizing, I, I had a chill, it was just, uh, 
you know, it was fun flying the airplane, but it was even more significant to think about the history yeah. of, of what it took to, uh, to deal with what they were doing with in World War II. Uh, tonight at our annual dinner, which were sold out, sorry folks, um, we're recognizing three people. Um, yesterday I met the last World War II ace. Colonel Alst. Colonel Alst. And uh, he's going to come and talk to us. Um, and then there's another gentleman that we arranged earlier in the year. He was turning 100 and his, his daughter wanted to have him go up to the Naval Air Museum to celebrate his 100th birthday. Unfortunately, his health wasn't well enough that we could do that, but uh, Colonel Kettering's coming to the dinner tonight, and we're going to sing him happy birthday. Well, uh, I think Colonel Oust is going to make it. As a matter of fact, we've got him on schedule, OB, for 2030. Amazing, he, he, man, he's amazing got, man. He wants to make it to 120. Yeah. He says, after that, he'll you do can it have too. It. Yeah, he's, he'll do it. He's sharp. He's sharp at, at 97, and I think we've got arrangement uh, through the ATC guys. Uh, to get him up on an airplane on Saturday. Oh, that'd be wonderful. He'll be here Saturday morning, so he'll be that'd out be flying wonderful. around. The weather will be perfect, and uh, it'll put a grin on his face. He's into heavy equipment now. He's well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another thing, and maybe I should. <laughs> he was bragging about how he likes to go down I-4 at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> and I'm listening to this with, with David Lighting from EA headquarters, and I'm saying, this is the real Maverick. Yeah. You know, this this is the real deal. Um uh, you know, another thing we're doing, I ju it just triggered my mind at our banquet tonight. The Ray Foundation is a foundation that supported uh, aviation uh, education for years. Uh, they've worked with EAA to give a million dollars to chapters, uh, provide youth scholarships. Uh, we're giving out the very first Ray scholarship tonight at our dinner. Um, so yeah, James James C. Ray, he's he's got a big swath up in Lakeland as well with oh, the, he uh, started the Central with the Florida Academy. Air Academy. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, James passed a, a, you know, a year or so ago, and, and Chuck Ahern is the CEO and president of the foundation. He's one of our panelists tonight. Uh, we're, our dinner tonight is focusing on options and opportunities, and we have three people coming in uh, to speak. Chuck Ahern from the foundation, Cindy Hasselbring, AOPA's high school uh, curriculum director, and then our, our good friend Story Musgrave. Mm -hmm. Um, so the three of them are going to talk about what young people need to do to get ready for the future. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, story, uh, it, we go way back. When, when you see uh. Story, will you tell him that Ben Coleman said hello? <laughs> it, he'll, he'll, he'll light up. Oh, yeah, Ben. But did you know he's a palm farmer? Oh, yeah. Palm tree farmer. And heavy equipment operator. Yeah. Yeah, he loves yeah. to drive those trucks. I've got a picture of him in, in front of a uh, two-and-a-half deuce uh, yeah. uh, that he got on eBay. <laughs> he's so proud of that. He, he got a real, real He bottom. is. He is an amazing man. Yeah. All the things he's done and never finished high school, you know, got his equivalency in, in the Marines. Um, he's a good friend. He's a chapter member, yeah. and uh, he comes down when he's not traveling the world to help build a, the uh, air cam with the kids. Uh, the kids love him. He loves the kids. Um, he, he, he is a classic, a classic yeah. act. Well, John, we're going to wind it up at this one. It's and, been a uh, pleasure, Ben. And me Thank as well. You. Thank you for joining us here. In, Anytime. Uh, studio audience uh stay tuned because we've got other folks just uh, just almost as dynamic as john <laughs> roush now when they hear they're they're much more dynamic than john roush but uh the thing is we're here that's right we're here and uh we are uh we're going to be here for the rest of the day and we are going to uh have another interview here in a while we're gonna let uh, john uh, get back to his busy day uh, weather's gorgeous, and he's getting wound up for you Saturday. So we're going to uh, sign it off on this interview, and I'm Ben Coleman, one of your hosts, and uh, we will see you later. Thanks, man. That was fun. <laughs>